This is A Word, a podcast from Slate. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. April is Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month. For African-American families, responding to a diagnosis can be complicated by struggling school systems and a lack of access to the basic medical care. But autistic people and their families are finding ways to build bright futures. If we treat a person with autism right, they could be the smartest person that you'd ever meet. Moving Beyond Autism Awareness, coming up on A Word with me, Jason Johnson. Stay with us. This episode is brought to you by Circle. What is Circle? First of all, it's a beautiful shape. It's consistent, inclusive, but it's also a place to build USDC, a digital dollar that's actually dollar-backed one-to-one. At Circle, they're building a future where money will travel at the speed of the internet for fractions of a penny. It's the place where crypto meets stability, where local businesses meet global customers, and the US dollar meets USDC. Visit circle.com slash Spotify. Welcome to A Word, a podcast about race and politics and everything else. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. April is Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month. And for many Americans, it's the only time of year when they think about it. But for millions of families, an autism diagnosis can turn their world upside down. And for black folks, getting care and treatment is complicated by economic factors, lack of health services, and institutional racism in schools. But there are folks who've dedicated their lives and careers to helping autistic kids and adults in the black community lead happy, productive and independent lives. One of them is Dr. Ashley Wiley Johnson. She's the vice president of the Los Angeles Speech and Language Therapy Center. She's also the co-author of Autism Spectrum Disorders from Theory to Practice, Assessment and Intervention Tools Across the Lifespan. Ashley Wiley Johnson, welcome to A Word. Thank you, Jason. Happy to be here. Most people really don't necessarily know what autism is. Define autism. What does it actually look like? So by definition, autism is a neurogenic disorder. People that have autism are impacted with impaired social interaction, ability to develop relationships, and also repetitive and restrictive behaviors. That's the formal definition. But what it looks like in practice, many people might say a person that looks a little quirky or difficulties with social skills. Even though it's not a part of the diagnostic process when you're younger, it may look like a child that has different language skills, or maybe they're nonverbal, they're not speaking at all. What are some myths about autism, particularly in the Black community? I I can say, you know, from a pop culture standpoint, it's probably Rain Man was the first time I had any sort of knowledge or encounter of anyone with autism. What are some stereotypes out there uh, about people with autism? Wow. I feel like the first stereotype, you're right, is the Rain Man. That savant, that character, Rain Man really was the first movie that put autism on the map. However, based on culture, like in the Black community, autism is still a stigma in some regards. It's an additional label that their child has to carry. So you'll see a lot of differences in how people respond to it. Thankfully, because of people like you, you know, doing different things and really spreading the word about autism, people are becoming a little bit desensitized to it. But I've seen the shift where it started off because of that sort of quirky behavior that sometimes people will describe, which is oftentimes like the impaired social skills, you will see that people will think, oh, this person's just weird or, oh, like they just don't like eye contact. Those are things that you would see. Now, some of those are features of the disorder. But it doesn't persist across the lifespan and its presentation changes, you know, at different moments. I always tell parents when they come in with an autism diagnosis, the first thing they think is like, is my child ever going to be able to talk? Are they ever going to be able to have real relationships? Will they get a job? Am I going to be supporting them for their life? And so what I really encourage people to understand is that what your child looks like at this moment, it's very possible that they're going to look completely different the next moment that we get a chance to look at them with the right intervention if that occurs in between. So I think those are the stereotypes. Of course, looking at it from the positive perspective, you know, what are all the the strengths that neurodiverse individuals, and that's people with autism, have? And so you might see extremely high cognitive skills. I've had three-year-olds that maybe could not communicate, but I'd give them a chapter book and they could read the whole chapter book. 
Seriously, I've seen that. So there's that significant ability to understand things, but not necessarily have a connection. That's really what you'll see. In addition to myths, you had some rumors out there and some really negative ones about autism that I want us to sort of debunk. For years, you had some doctors claim that there was like a link between vaccinations and autism. It's still a belief that some people have. And, and in the wake of sort of, you know, vaccine hesitancy and everything else like that with COVID, you still have a certain strand of people in this country who think, oh, my gosh, if I take this vaccine, my child ends up autistic. I mean, there have been celebrities that were sort of promoting that kind of myth. How do you combat those myths and how do you deal with parents who may be afraid or may be blaming the medical system for their child's neurodiversity? You know, I've heard that, of course. And the vaccine thought, we have to go off of research, right? Everybody needs to keep calm. Let's go off of what the research is. And the research right now is showing no tie between the vaccine dosages and connection to autism. Because autism we're still learning a lot about it. There's some things that we just don't know. So for example, I was recently having a conversation about somebody that focuses on gut health. That's something that's like a unique trait for individuals with autism. And so they look at nutrition. How can we adjust nutrition to help the child? Now, sometimes the person will see lessening of symptoms. Fine. You know, the family's able to live a pretty typical lifestyle. But the thing that I think occurs is people throwing out this word of like, we're cured. And so associated with that, you have to be careful if you're doing some sort of like food treatment, or you're saying, well, I'm not going to do any of these vaccines and the symptoms are less now, you know, now they don't have autism anymore. It kind of is like a dangerous territory that I'm seeing people get into that I think we have to be careful of. For example, people like Jenny McCarthy, she's very clear about autism and the cure. And so what does that look like when somebody comes and maybe they don't have as much access and they're wondering why their child's not cured? You know, it increases frustration, hesitancy when it comes to certain treatment approaches. So I'm always really careful and tell parents, until we know otherwise, we've got to go off of the data that we know, which we know it's a disability and we know that there's no cure for it. Now your child can adapt and have a wonderful life. And that's really the goal at the end of the day. But I don't, you know, want to sell hoop dreams to anybody and tell them that I'm curing their child. And uh, for the audience that may be uh, millennials or Zoomers, Jenny McCarthy was a former Playboy pet uh, who was a host on MTV and then a host on several other things. I'm hurt by the fact that there could be people in my audience who don't know who she is. Um, 100%. (laughs) In a recent episode, uh, we talked about corporal punishment in the black community. And how do you sort of talk to parents about ideas of discipline in, in childhood management with children who are neurodivergent, with children who do have autism, so that you can find that line between like, I can't have my son or daughter screaming in the middle of Applebee's, but I also recognize that they're not processing this environment the way that other children do. I think the first thing is us supporting with parent training. I work with my mom and she started a program called Parent Professional Partnership early on when we weren't even talking about putting the parent in the center of services. So one of the things that we would do was talk about like discipline, but from a cultural perspective, because for many years, Black people have done different things to try to uh, shield their child, keep them protected that culture of like, we don't want to be embarrassed, our family. So we've seen certain behavioral challenges hit harder in those communities because there's also some associated emotions with that. So one of the things that I think focusing on is, first of all, communication. I feel like we try to shift parents from looking at their child to observing their child and the setting. So looking for triggers, every action, there's always something ahead of time that's going to give you a warning. So we'll try to help parents to be aware of what are the warning signs that this, that something's going to occur so that you could try to shift the situation. So there's things like that, being more observative, helping to understand what is the intent behind the act. Well, what is he saying? He's saying he's hungry. So now if we think about this ahead of time, oh, it's probably going to be time for him to eat. This or he's going to, when he starts to look like this, then it means I need to do this. That's where we really help when it comes to parent training. But then, in addition to that, 
We also use different tools. For example, somebody that maybe is experiencing what you said, what you described, I've heard adults now describe even this past week talking about like sensory things when they would walk into environments that were overwhelming and or, you know, have situations where they felt what we would call a sensory overload. And they have described it as like a vacuum playing in their head the whole time and not able to hear anything or needles in their head, feeling like they're being pinched as they're just going to a regular place, you know, like a Chuck E. Cheese, for example. I mentioned them because they've done pretty well now with creating sensory Sundays as like an initiative, a national initiative to, to really help the children that have those sensory overloads. So anyways, all of this is to say, understanding that now and knowing how painful it is for a child, there's also tools that we might use, for example, like a chew tube, you know, to help a child to be able to, instead of, you know, ah, screaming, they can bite down and receive some sensory input. And I've seen situations where some of these different strategies and or tools, you will literally see a child's body completely decompress. You can just see like that overload, what it looks like. So we try to help families with those tools too. But then that comes into the big issue, what we're talking about in the black community. We don't have many people that are going to say, well, let me give you this instrument. Let me get you a different seat that you can carry with your child. Now, some people do, but a lot of people don't have access. So it's still a disparity. We're going to take a short break and we come back more on autism in the black community. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. In Northern Virginia, you can make your future better because we've made college better with over 100 certificate and degree programs that prepare you for in-demand jobs by making tuition affordable and manageable through smaller payments over time with classes that fit your schedule. Northern Virginia Community College. We're the affordable, achievable, incredible college. Nova. We make college better. Apply now at boldlynova.com. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today, we're talking about autism in the African-American community with Dr. Ashley Wiley Johnson. How did you become involved in providing care and therapy for autistic children, young adults, adults, and their parents? How did you get involved? What was your journey to this kind of work? My mother, it was 44 years ago now that she established our organization. And so as an organization, our experience and journey with autism, she always talks about how it was like a large release from the mental institutions before we had a clear understanding of what autism looked like. You know, when you think about like some disorders that we've known about autism, we're still kind of early in this. Initially, many people who had an autism diagnosis were labeled as schizophrenic and put into mental institutions. And so there was a wave where they changed the law And many individuals were released from the mental institutions and they had no services for these people. And some of those people, they didn't even know as having autism. They said, you know, this is schizophrenia. This is uh, mental retardation. That phrase, like early on, they were using that before we know better. And so there's this, this wave of individuals. So my mom was really fascinated and became interested in this specific population of people and started to really develop treatment. So now here I am 38 years ago at this point, and I'm here and she has this organization. And I tell people that if child labor had a face, it for sure would be me, you know, because my mom was a single mom. So some days I was the peer model. Some days I was the secretary. Some days I was, you know, just helping out, waiting for my mom to get done with work. So that's kind of how that started my work with the kids. But I didn't realize that this was going to be my life work. I went to school and was always into theater, got my BA in dramatic arts from UNC Chapel Hill. So at that point, I decided, why don't I try to do speech pathology? Let me just go and do it. And I came across a woman, Brenda Mitchell, one of my favorite mentors of all time. And so she had this great class. And I started to see that I didn't have to do exactly what my mom did and be a speech pathologist. It was the quickest A I'd ever gotten because. I realized that I understood a little bit about this. So fast forward from there, 
I realized that I then wanted to go into graduate school and I naturally fell into place. I went into the school district, you know, I, I, I did my graduate school. I realized that even though I used to say like, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a teacher. I want to be a voice therapist. That's what I wanted to do. But it's a funny way how suddenly, you know, my passion, which was theater, and then my career, which was speech. And then I realized that I actually enjoyed working with this group and then was able to put my drama skills with my ability to do therapy. And then we created now 17 years ago, Drama Kings and Queens, which was the theater and speech camp combined for kids with special needs, specifically autism. You know, we were so focused on having the perfect life and the perfect plan, we didn't realize how we change and things change. Yeah, I don't think we could plan out our entire life. We just had to prepare ourselves. I'm just glad I got my best friends with me. Always. Always. Best friends. Always. And so I kind of had my own niche and I'm like, okay, this is me. This is theater. This is something I offer that is not what my mom does. And it's just been my life's work. And I realized like, I feel so happy. And my mom always talks about every day waking up and feeling passionate. And that's exactly how I feel. Uh, One thing I want to follow up with that. I've seen drama Kings and Queens. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing to see not just the young people on various forms of the spectrum do a play and express themselves and connect with an audience. But the reactions from the parents would bring tears to your eyes because these are parents who've worked so hard with their children with the program. But what you also have are training centers from different corporations that have connected with your organization to teach young people on the autism spectrum about customer service, about interacting. But how do you get a corporate sponsor to say, yeah, it's worth my time and money to invest And a bunch of kids, oftentimes black and brown, uh, who are neurodivergent. How do you do that kind of work and and how has it manifested itself in your programs? It's been interesting. When it comes to the employment piece, once again, we look at working across the lifespan. What do you do when they're adults? Mind you, you know, they've had a full lifespan of treatment. So it looks different. And that's what's happening is autism now looks different than what it looked like even 20 years ago. And so you have these individuals that are highly capable of having these different jobs, but because of the way that disability and employment and shelter day programs, workshops and things like that, they were placed in settings that were not really maximizing their potential. My mom had these high expectations for her kids. So what we did was we have a nonprofit organization that's associated with our for-profit organization. And the nonprofit allows us space to be able to create like the best of the best therapy setting, the best of the best experience for the child, but also to develop relationships. And so she just started with going to individual corporations and asking them to consider hiring her kids. And it wasn't like she was asking for, you know, a thousand jobs. She was just asking for one job and also asking individuals to come to our office. And so Outback was the first organization that really fell in love with our kids, our adults. And I think that's kind of the thing that we try to do as an organization is really kind of show the individuals that we've worked with and show the impact and who they are. And so from there, Outback said, well, what are you doing at this room? You know, we've got our main office is a large 10,000 square foot building. So then they said, we'd love to make this into a training center, just this one room. Can we use this one room? My mom said yes. And it spread like wildfire. Um, She began training people. Our approach is a little different because it's like we want people that are in their jobs to know how to work with people with autism. But we just as much want a person with autism to know how to work effectively in this setting because it has to work for both people. And so we started to do those sort of trainings, like let's prepare for individuals with autism in your workplace. And I think that the thorough approach in terms of just like really training everybody and being open and just having open conversations about what does this look like? How could this impact my regular workflow has made different corporations who come to us increase their knowledge, but also their desire to want to hire neurodiverse people. 
I think about the work you do in contrast to what a lot of black kids in particular with autism face in public schools. If they're not tracked into a program like this, if they don't find out about a program like this, you know, they're often determined to be uh, mentally slow or they're told that they are behavioral problems or the parent doesn't want to believe it's an autism diagnosis. They just want to say the kid is hard headed. How does your program I mean, do you guys sweep into public schools? Do you get children referred to you from public schools who are seen as having difficulties? Because the, the, the racial bias in the institutions that young people are in when these diagnoses come to the fore are oftentimes not particularly supportive. Oh, absolutely. Well, the odds are against us when it comes to autism. So right now we know autism impacts one in 36 eight-year-olds. I tell people, I'm like, close your eyes. You probably quickly can think of 36 people in your world. One of those people for sure has autism based on these statistics. And if you think about just eight-year-olds in general of this group, of this particular uh, statistic, Black people have the highest prevalence within this statistics. In addition to that, Rutgers University just did a study where they talked about how of the group of individuals of autism, Black people are three times less likely to receive a diagnosis or they're misdiagnosed if they don't present with very heightened, uh, an additional, well, basically it's an additional diagnosis, which would be intellectual disability. So that's the only way that they're capturing these Black children. A child who maybe just shows differences with social skills, maybe some repetitive and restrictive behaviors, they're three times less likely to slide under the crack. So just with getting the diagnosis, there's a challenge. And that's in general. Now you put them into the school system. And the difficulty is, if they missed getting a proper diagnosis from a psychiatrist, neurodevelopmental pediatrician, speech pathologist, if they miss one of those really strong diagnoses, like a great team, then they're going to just be put into the school system, which there's many of the school systems. Many programs are not autism specific. They might just put the child in special education. And what we know about autism is there's unique ways that we need to work with neurodiverse individuals to tap into them. And so then you've got a family just kind of going with speech therapy all the basic services that a school district is able to provide, which, I mean, it's no fault to the district. The district's responsibility is help the child to access the curriculum. And we know that education is just a big conundrum in itself. So the odds are against them. And that's where we just have a problem. Access is huge. It's like many families, like the the best of the best, the Cadillac of the experience, I would say is the school district plus services. And if your local school district is the only person that's captured you, you're only going to be able to access what your school district can offer you, which we know is not much. And so the game right now is to get the word out. It's to increase parents' knowledge about what their child could have, to decrease these stigmas. What is your child going to look like? It's not what it looks like right now. This could be Bill Gates. It, It could be any of these people. But if a parent knew that my child could potentially, when you compare that to what your child might look like at 18 months or three years when they're screaming and not doing anything or doing things differently, you know, I think just that little bit of promise can change the trajectory of the child's life. We're going to take a short break and we come back more about autism within the black community with Ashley Wiley Johnson. This is a word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by Circle. What is Circle? First of all, it's a beautiful shape. It's consistent, inclusive, but it's also a place to build USDC, a digital dollar that's actually dollar-backed one-to-one. At Circle, they're building a future where money will travel at the speed of the internet for fractions of a penny. It's the place where crypto meets stability, where local businesses meet global customers, and the US dollar meets USDC. Visit circle.com slash Spotify. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today, we're talking about autism in the black community with Dr. Ashley Wiley Johnson. 
You've talked about the difficulty in getting a proper diagnosis for autism, especially for African-American families. What should a parent do if they feel that their child hasn't been diagnosed as thoroughly or properly as necessary so that they can get the tools they need to help that child therapeutically with autism? Absolutely. Every state is different. So in California, in addition to being able to speak with your pediatrician, you could also go straight to the regional centers. It's a location and it's a place where you can go get your child tested and separate from the school district. One of the things that I am spending time really focusing on is helping to ensure that policy kind of shifts a little bit to allow some of these other critical services and treatments to be given at the level of the pediatrician, you know, because the first thing you do is go to your doctor and say, like, especially if your child's 18 months, three years, the school district doesn't have to come into play until preschool. So if your pediatrician doesn't have the tools available to refer, then you're just stuck. Oh, the doctor said he's fine. Come back to the next checkup. So I feel like the important thing that has to occur is that we start to look at How can we get the word out at the level of your pediatrician or at the healthcare systems so that you can get access to services, not relying on the school district, which we know is oftentimes taxed already. But the thing that I think is important, aside from what's the legislation, what's the healthcare access, how do you actually get that? There's also the issue of your gut feeling. And that's really what we talk about all the time I talk with parents. And I'm like, Yo, if you feel that there's something wrong, just keep looking for that help, whether it means that I need to go to the next doctor or the next doctor or the next doctor until this doctor is listening. When I say my baby's not speaking the way or he's not looking at me, I haven't seen him smile yet. That's how we're going to have to get through this is really just listen to our guts. So I hope that things change. But right now it's state specific and access specific. In the Black community, I know of parents who know of the challenges that young people face in the criminal justice system because of systematic racism, in public schools because of systematic racism. And I've heard people actually say, look, maybe my child's autistic, maybe they're not, but you know what? If I go too far with these analyses, if I go too far with this testing, my local school district is just going to track my child And they're going to end up in classes with kids who have behavioral problems that are above and beyond what my child is experiencing. You know, I'm just going to roll the die and not go so far with this analysis because I'm afraid of my child being tracked. What are some of the risks to that child if a parent sort of holds off of a full diagnosis of autism for fear that they'll be tracked in the system? Because the fear is real. But what are the potential consequences if you don't start addressing these issues early? The thing that I like to remind people is if we're talking about autism, it's important to know that social skills is a hallmark feature of the disorder and it persists across the lifespan. So what does that look like? You know, when your child is little, it might look like I'm just not connecting, you know, smiles and playing and they play differently. Maybe they're not playing. And of course, there's speech, but the problems will persist. So now maybe the child starts talking or they start to communicate to the best level that they can. Okay, that's good. He's saying little things. And that usually is the thing, even though that's not one of the characteristics of autism, that's usually an associated symptom. So now we're looking at bullying, third and fourth grade, issues with relationships, developing those relationships. Now we go into high school years, puberty occurs, differences with how they deal with grooming understanding those sensory challenges. You know, my child only wants his one shirt. So now he's wearing this shirt throughout the rest of school. And maybe he doesn't realize that it's smelly and other people are around him and they don't want to be friends with him because he's actually not smelling well. You know, that's an extreme example, but it's actually not extreme. Like I see it every single day with with older people with autism. So what I think parents need to realize is if you miss out on that diagnosis, You're missing out on the potential to help your child understand how to connect with other people. We have cases of that now where you'll see individuals that they said, well, they thought he had autism and they do something extreme. Or maybe you see, for example, one of the things that they talk about now is 
high functioning individuals with autism, one of the big traits are loneliness and anxiety. And so now if you haven't helped your child build those tools or even understand why they need to develop those relationships, you might be looking at an individual who will down the line start to show signs of depression. I think it's important to realize that we have to get past this label and we need to get the services just like white people are getting the services. And I'm going to say that because they're the group that seems to have the highest level of access. I believe that's what we're missing out on if we don't embrace it. And I think it's important to realize, you know, what we're trying to do, we just took a group of 13 adults to Washington, D.C. to show them what is adults with autism, Black people, what do we look like? What does it look like if we've had services across the lifespan? What could we look like? So I'm really hoping that we have more adults and more individuals that have kind of come along on their journey to show other people what the potential could be so that we could try to embrace it a little bit more. April is Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month. What's one thing, if you could wave a magic wand and have everybody understand this about autism and weren't just thinking about it in the month of April, but we're thinking about it throughout, what's one thing you would want them to know? If we treat a person with autism right, they could be the smartest person that you'd ever meet. They could be the person with the most potential that you would have ever imagined if we treat them right. And the goal would be to treat them right from the start. Dr. Ashley Wiley Johnson is an expert on autism and the vice president of the Los Angeles Speech and Language Therapy Center. Thanks so much for joining me today on A Word. Thank you, Jason. And that's A Word for this week. The show's email is a word at slate.com. This episode was produced by Ayana Angel. Ben Richmond is Slate's Senior Director of Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is the Vice President of Slate Audio. Our theme music was produced by Don Will. I'm Jason Johnson. Tune in next week for Word. Word.